हरे कृष्णा am i audible to everyone behind thank you so i'll speak today on the topic of we need to forgive ourselves to give ourselves to krishna to practice bhakti means we have to offer ourselves to krishna but to give ourselves to krishna we need to forgive ourselves so i'll talk about this in both parts first i'll talk about what does it mean to forgive ourselves then i'll talk about what does it mean to give ourselves to krishna and then we'll conclude by talking about how forgiving helps us to helps us in giving <coughs> this i speak based on bhagavad gita 18.35 yo yaya swapnam bhayam shokam vishadam madame vacha navi munchati durmedha druti sa partha tamasi krishna says that there is determination in the mode of ignorance and that determination means that one holds on to things that hurt us we keep daydreaming we keep worrying we keep resenting we keep lamenting we keep being pessimistic we keep being morose and even if tell people tell us don't do this just forget it just move on with life but still our mind somehow holds on to it and that way we hurt ourselves far more than we need to so this krishna says is perverse determination determination in the mode of ignorance at one level if something bad happens to us and especially if something bad happens to us as a reaction to the bad that we have done then we feel double bad we feel bad because we are suffering and we feel bad because we committed the mistake so this is how the shrimad bhagavatam begins the shrimad bhagavatam is a devotional classic which describes the highest principles of bhakti and it begins with the hero parikshit maharaj committing a blunder under the pressure of thirst while he was deep in the forest he goes to a he sees a spot of hermitage and he goes there and he sees a sage deep in meditation now generally if someone is with closed eyes it's difficult to know what their state is if we come into a room and we see somebody lying down we may gently ask are you sleeping now if they don't respond and we presume that they are sleeping but if we, if they just came to the room a few minutes ago and are you sleeping and they don't know i'm awake what do you want so basically when somebody's eyes are closed it's difficult to know what their state is <coughs> so he knew that the sage had closed his eyes in meditation but he was not sure whether he was actually even when people do meditation there are different levels sometimes people go into a trance where they become oblivious to the external world but even seasoned yogis don't go into trance very easy so during the interim period they are in a transitional stage where they are partly aware of external situation and partly they are trying to go inwards so he thought that the yogi was in that stage suppose we <clears throat> we want to talk with someone we want to have some work with someone and then they are lying down in bed and we feel sure they are not sleeping and we call them and still they don't wake up they don't respond now we can wake up a sleeping person but we can't wake up a person who is pretending to be asleep <laughs> so similarly now if we feel that this person is simply pretending to sleep we get annoyed i am talking with you why are you not responding so something similar happened to parikshit maharaj he felt that the sage is not actually in trance and he is just pretending to neglect me and therefore what parikshit maharaj did was he said he just walked out in the half and while he was walking out he saw a dead snake lying nearby he picked it up with his bow and split it back and that snake went and fell on the body of and the neck of parikshit so the idea was uh, a petty gesture of displeasure it was basically you know 
when a guest comes to our house, we are meant to offer the guest a garland. He says, you didn't offer me a garland, but here I offer you a garland. Now, after he went back, he went to his palace, he took some water, and then he became pacified. And once that pressure of thirst went off, then he started thinking, hey, did I do the right thing? How can I be so sure? At that time, I felt sure that this sage was simply acting. But what if he had actually been meditating? <coughs> then I committed a serious offence. And then he started thinking, no, if I committed an offence like this, whatever reaction is there, let it come upon me. But let me, let that reaction take me towards Krishna, not away from Krishna. And then the sage son hears the, sees what has happened by his mystical vision and the impulsive rash moment, he curses Parikshit to die in seven days. And when Parikshit Maharaj gets this news, it's devastating. See, normally, if death comes suddenly, see, all of us are going to die. But all of us feel like, yeah, death is long way away. 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line. So when death is a very long way away, it doesn't pain us so much. When death comes in one moment, this, we are driving a car, it's an accident and it's a fatal accident. There also there is pain, no doubt, because we are attached to the body. But, there is, it's just in a moment, it's over. But, if somebody tells us, you've got cancer, we are going to die in two months. Then those two months become like agony. Maybe I might be able to cure myself, maybe I'll find some cure. What if this happens, what if that happens? So in between, if death is very far away or if death is immediate, it doesn't seem to trouble us so much. But if death is a finite, measurable distance away, it actually agonizes us much. So, I was at a cancer care center, I was giving a talk to the care providers and there they were telling me that actually people who get cancer, more than the cancer killing them, it is their depression that kills them. Because when they get cancer, especially if the cancer seems incurable, and they sink into such depression that <clears throat> the disease cancer is actually quite mysterious. And some people, they say, have greater resilience and they can live much longer than what is expected. This is a cancer patient, he said, uh, the doctor told me, one of the doctors, there's another doctor who diagnosed this cancer patient, you are going to die in six months. And the patient is still alive after seven years, and the doctor who is diagnosed died. <laughs> <laughs> so, life and death are quite unpredictable at times. But the point is that when there's a short time, when there's a seven, it's, it's very easy to get depressed. Oh, you know, why did this have to happen to me? I was having such a nice, happy life. And on top of that, Parishit Mahalaj was also living dharmically, he was living a pious, devoted life. And suddenly everything is taken away. So, there could be two forms of anger, broadly speaking. One is anger directed outwards and the other is anger directed inwards. Anger directed outwards leads to violence. Verbal violence or even physical violence. Anger directed inwards leads to depression. It leads to inferiority complex. It leads to self-esteem issues. And the ultimate expression of anger directed inwards is suicide. Where we feel so angry with ourselves, we feel that we, we can't bear being in our own life. We can't bear to be in our own life. And that time people end their lives. So when bad things happen to us, anger can come in both ways. One is, Parikit Maharaj Kura said, how dare this boy curse me? Even if I committed a mistake, now Parikit Maharaj himself is a king. And a king knows the principles of justice. As to punishment has to be, in any crime, the punishment has to be in proportion to the crime. Not in proportion to the outrage felt about the crime. 
outrage is subjective. So he knew that from any standard, okay, he disrespected a sage, he put a garland around the neck of the sage. The punishment to die for that is outrageously disproportionate. So he could have become angry at this boy. How dare he do such a thing? Or he could have become angry with himself. Oh, why did I do such a thing? Everything was going right in my life. Why did I have to put that garland around this person's neck? And now my whole life is ruined. So Parikshit Maharaj did not blame Shringi, the son of Shamik Rishi, but he did not blame himself also. Now he held, there's a difference between holding oneself responsible and blaming oneself. Holding oneself responsible means, okay, this is, I should have acted like this, I acted like this. This was a mistake on my part. You're holding ourselves responsible. But blaming ourselves means taking a stick and beating ourselves mentally. You are such a fool, you are useless, you're hopeless. Just keep beating yourself, keep beating yourself. Now all of us in our lives have committed mistakes and some mistakes they have some small consequences, some mistakes have big consequences and some mistakes can have catastrophic consequences. Now, how many of you can think of some mistake in your life which change your life forever? And if you think of it, you don't have to tell it. So you don't have to tell it. But yeah. So if you're not committed, you're fortunate. <laughs> but it's we all can think of things when we now if we look back at our life, if our life we treated like a movie, real, then we would like to go back and replay some parts of our life. Not just replay it in the same way, but redo it. So play it in a different way. So many times we do something wrong, and at that time. We feel very bad. We start beating ourselves. Why did I do this? Why did I do this? Why did I do this? And that can agonize us. That can torment us. <clears throat> a few months ago, I spoke at Stanford University. And after that, I was talking with a the professor there. So he was telling that in these unis, as, as, as uh, Ivy League universities and universities of that level, there's a huge amount of competition and that competition leads to you just telling me about an interview with a student from Yale. He said, 50% of the time, uh, I felt good because I felt I was better than others. And 50% of the time, I felt bad because I felt everyone else was better than me. So, these students, they oscillate between megalomania and depression. I am so good and I am so bad. And this oscillation it makes them very unpredictable. In India and Mumbai, we have, we have, we have the top colleges are IITs. So in IITs, when I was at the IIT Kharagpur, a professor over there who also looks after the ethics department, he had come to meet me and he was talking. He said there's a big problem that some of the brightest students from India end up committing suicide. And he's telling that they found a series of Indians, students in this college, has committed suicide in a similar way. There were, they, there were fans in their rooms, and they would tie a rope to the fan, they would tie the rope around their neck, and they would use this cricket bat to touch the button. The button, they would close their room, touch the button, and it would be quite brutal. So when this happened like that, a series of suicides happened. So the IIT management committee met together. It is this a serious problem? What do we do about it? And they passed a resolution with immediate effect. So replace all the fans in the rooms with air conditioners. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it, it is not the fans that are making people commit suicide. So, obviously they also understand that. But how to help people at an internal level, it's very difficult to do that. So better at least deal with the externals. That was the idea. So, internally, if we have to deal with this, we have to learn to forgive ourselves. Forgive ourselves means, 
we all have a certain expectation of how we should be. No, I should be doing this like this, I should be doing this like this, I should be doing like this. These expectations may have been formed from our parents, these expectations may form from our peers, these expectations may even be formed from the spiritual society around us. We, we come to bhakti and we understand it. Bhakti means following certain standards. So then all these set some expectations for us. And when we are not able to meet those expectations, at that time we feel disappointed and the anger comes. And if that anger is directed inwards, then we start beating ourselves. So Parikshit Maharaj did not do this. It is only because he was not beating himself up internally that he was able to offer himself to Krishna. When Shukadeva Goswami came over there and all the sages before that came over there, Parikshit Maharaj did not ask any of them. Why it has happened to me? He was grateful. He was grateful that he told the sages, now that I am about to face my final exam, I am so grateful to you that you have come here to help me along this final journey. So Parikshit Maharaj demonstrates that even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can be grateful in all situations. We can't be grateful for all situations. That means bad things sometimes happen in our life. When bad things happen in our life, it's very, very difficult to at that time feel grateful. All that we feel is usually resentful. Why did this have to happen? And that is an understandable emotion. But what is not understandable or what is not desirable is just obsessing over the emotion. So if we look at the situation, we will feel resentful. But if we look around the situation, we can't be grateful for all situations but we can be grateful in all situations. In all situations means that instead of looking at the problem, instead of looking at what has gone wrong in our life, we look at what is right in our life. So Parishit Maharaj looked at what is right. He said, yes, yes this curse has come, but these sages are there to bless me, to guide me, to equip me to pass this final exam. So if somebody's got a disease, now that disease is bad, it's difficult to feel grateful for that disease. But you can feel grateful, oh, you know, I have a supportive family over here, I have basic good health, I have medical insurance, this disease is curable. And I'm grateful for this. So we can't, be, even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can be grateful in all situations. So when sometimes, a problem comes because of something beyond our control. So we are working well at our job and suddenly we are fired because the company has a policy of retrenchment. That time we feel angry but we also, okay, what can I do? It's not in my control. But sometimes when we ourselves have committed some mistake and then that mistake leads to some serious consequence then it's very easy to beat ourselves. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And that becomes like a tone that keeps rep repeating within us, hammering us from within. And then if we are just being beaten up ourselves, like beating up ourselves like this, then we can't do anything. So oh, how do we when if we have committed a mistake like this, if we if we had certain expectation of ourselves and we were not able to live up to that expectation, then how do we forgive ourselves? I'll talk about two points in this. The first point is that we are the only resource that we have. 
we are the only resource that we have. If we beat ourselves up, we are basically hurting the only resource that we have. Suppose say we are driving a car to go to some important meeting and somehow the car stops working or the fuel runs out or something happens and then now we have to spend time to fix the car. We will be angry. But if in that anger we pick up a big stone and throw it to the car and break the car itself. <laughs> now with the car little broken it will get delayed in getting to the destination. But if we break the car further we never get to the destination. So if that is if that is the only car we have, yes it's not working well. But this is what I have. I have to work with this only. So similarly for us, we are the only resource we have. And we are not a dispensable or a replaceable resource for us. Like a car gets damaged, you can get another car. But we cannot get another we. Even Krishna can't help us unless we are ready to help ourselves. We at least have to receive Krishna's help. We are the only resource we have. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that we can do everything. But no one can do anything for us unless we cooperate. It's like say, suppose somebody was walking along the road and they didn't notice the road properly and there was some grass and below that grass there was a big well. They fall into the well. Now they fall into the well, it's terrible. Oh, why didn't I see this? Why didn't I see this well? I should have been more vigilant. I can be angry with myself. But if somebody is outside and they are throwing a rope down to us, then nobody else can hold that rope up for us. It is we who have to hold the rope. So, others can help us only if we are ready to take the help. If we are not ready to take the help, then no matter what others do, it becomes impossible for others to help us. Sometimes in India it happens that if you are driving a car and the car doesn't start. It may happen, I have not seen it, I travel a lot, I have not seen it happen here. But if the car doesn't start, then all the nearby people come and they start pushing the car. Does it happen here also? Sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> rarely, okay. It's a jump cable. Oh, it's a jump starter cable, is it? So, so then, suppose all the people nearby are pushing. And the person inside is also moving the steering wheel, pressing the various buttons to get the car to start. And together, they get the car to start. And then the car starts moving. But suppose, the car is not starting and people from outside are pushing. And the driver inside goes to sleep. <laughs> or, worse still, the driver inside is pressing the brake actively. <laughs> Then, people will say, why should we push? What is the use of our pushing? So similarly, if the car is to be driven, the driver has to cooperate. Sometimes the car may be so jammed that the driver alone can't do much. But unless the driver does their part, the car will not move. So similarly for us, we are our only resource. And if we don't handle ourselves well, no one else can do it for us. Uddhare dātmana atmanam nātmanam avasādayet. Atmaiva yātmano bandhur atmaiva ripurātmana. Krishna says, elevate yourself with the mind. Don't degrade yourself with the mind. Now what this means is Krishna says, you have to elevate yourself with the mind. I can help you, but it is you who have to do it. Otherwise the mind will degrade. So we are our only resource and if we beat ourselves up, then we are damaging the only resource that we have and that is self-destructive, that is stupid. So we need to forgive ourselves because we have, we are, because apart from we, we don't have anyone. At a practical level also in today's world, many people live alone. Even if people live in a family, there is a lot of loneliness that is there. In the past, there were joint families. Then there are nuclear families. Now even the nucleus is split. 
and there are protons and uh, neutrons also orbiting around in the concrete jungles. So it's sad. But if we are physically alone, even if we are not physically alone, but still we are ultimately existentially alone. We are born into this world alone, we die, we leave this world alone. During the journey, we appear to be together with each other. And yes, we can help each other. But we can help each other only to the extent other person wants the help. When the army is there in a battalion, all the soldiers are together. But in the battle, every soldier is alone. In the battalion, they are all together. But in the actual battle, the bullet is going to come, they are alone. Each soldier has to fight for oneself. Soldiers can help others also. Here, we are not talking about not helping each other. But starting with the foundation. That we can help others or others can help others only to the extent we want that help. Only to the extent we are ready to take that help. So therefore, we have to forgive ourselves. That means, look, this is the only resource I have. I am myself the only resource. If I, if I am not forgiving myself, then I am mentally beating myself up. And by mentally beating myself, I am simply disempowering myself. I am damaging myself. And then I can't do anything further. Having said this, this is not to simply, as I said earlier, there is a difference between holding ourselves responsible and blaming ourselves. When we say forgive ourselves doesn't mean, okay, what I did was not wrong. Or what I did is not wrong, that's okay, it happens. Now, the point is, okay, what I did was wrong, but now I have to move on with life. We, we can acknowledge the wrong that we have, but we don't have to beat ourselves up for it. This brings us to the next point now. That actually sometimes we feel, oh, I made that mistake and my life is ruined now. You know, I chose this career instead of that career. I decided to uh, study in this university or this instead of that university. I decided to marry this person instead of that person. I decided to do this instead of that and my whole life has become ruined by that. We feel like that. Some decisions can have serious consequences. Here we need to understand that Krishna's plan includes our mistakes. Krishna doesn't cause us to make our mistakes, but Krishna's plan can accommodate our mistakes. That means even if we have made some mistake in the past, it is not that Krishna, Krishna kicks us out because of that. So, to understand this, I will take two examples. Suppose we are driving along a road and the GPS tells us turn right and we turn left. And we turn left, what does the GPS do after that? The GPS says, get lost. <laughs> no, the GPS doesn't do that. The GPS, says, okay, the GPS will again reroute and tell, okay, you go from here this way. So, we have taken a wrong turn, but GPS immediately reroutes and tells us from there how we can get to the right destination. So similarly for us, even if we take a wrong turn in life, Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. So he also is there in our hearts with us. Sarvasti Chaha And from within our hearts, he will guide us. Even if we have taken a wrong turn, he will show a path for us from that wrong turn also. Now the wrong turns are not inconsequential. Every wrong turn that we take, it will have a consequence in terms of that it will take us longer to get to the destination. So we are not trivializing the mistake that has been done. But there are two extremes, one is to trivialize a mistake, the other is to catastrophize the mistake. Because of this mistake now everything is lost. Okay, even if we took a wrong turn, we can always take a right turn. Suppose, say, we had invited someone for a meeting and we call them. Where are you? Hey, I'm here, you know, I took a wrong turn. Okay, and then say, okay, now, please, you take a right turn. Come in. No, but I was, you know, I took a wrong turn. It's okay, you know, I, but I was so foolish, I took a wrong turn. Okay, now you take a right turn. No, no, but I was so foolish, why did I take that wrong turn? And now you take a right turn. No, but why did I take that wrong turn? Okay, you took it, now it's over. Just take a right turn and come back now. So, just as 
GPS has got the whole globe mapped out so that even if somebody takes a wrong turn, it can come back on the right path after that. They can still be taken to the right destination. So similarly, Krishna has, Krishna's, Krishna doesn't plan that we commit mistakes. But Krishna's plan includes our mistakes. Krishna's plan can accommodate our mistakes and even through our mistakes we can move forward. So therefore there is no need to become hopeless. Oh, I made this mistake and everything is lost. Even choices that we have to take in our life, sometimes when we are about to take a choice, we think this choice is so important. It's important to think seriously before we take any important choices, important decisions in our life. But thinking is a peculiar thing. In the sense that, say if we have to lift some weight, if we have to lift a heavy weight, there are two hands who are lifting it up. Then with two hands, we might with one hand we can lift a certain amount of weight. With two hands we can lift more weight. We put four hands over there, two more people come, one more person comes in, we can lift even more. If six hands come up, ten hands come up. So the more hands we put, the more weight we'll be able to lift. That's how it works with respect to physical things. But with respect to mental things, it is not always like that. If there's a problem which we want to solve, then we have to put thinking effort. We have to apply our thought to deep to analyze the problem so that we can come up with a solution. But it is not that the more we think about the problem, the better the solution will come up with. There is a, with respect to physical energy, the more energy we apply, the graph just goes straight up. The more energy, the more the movement. But with respect to problems, mental problems, like the choices, decisions, regrets, it's, it's that, the graph goes up, peaks and then comes down. If we don't think and we act impulsively, then we often make, make wrong choices. So we need to analyze and deliberate so that we have thought the issue through carefully. But beyond a particular point, thinking about the problem simply confuses us, simply paralyzes us. Because Life never comes with a guarantee of the right choices. There are many. Sometimes when we make the decision right, and sometimes sometimes we make the right decision, and sometimes we have to make the decision right. Okay, I took this decision. It may not might not have been the best decision, but now how can I make it work? How can I make it right? So beyond a particular point when we start thinking of a problem. It doesn't solve the problem, the graph goes down. That means that thinking simply drains us. Drains us. No, oh, this person, this person spoke like that. Why did they speak like that? In response, I did like this. Why did I do like that? When I did like that, at least they should have understood. But why did they do like that? When they did like that, why did I do like this? It's good to analyze, to learn, but sometimes the mind is goes around. So at such times we just don't get anywhere. Krishna's plan works even through our mistakes. That's why when we talk about Krishna's plan, we have to understand it's not like a simple uh, railway track. In the railway track, the railway has to go on that track itself. Even a slight deviation means the railway will crash. It will not it'll get damaged, don't get to the destination. Krishna's plan is more like an airplane journey. When we have an airplane journey, a plane might come from, say, New York to LA. Now, to every day the plane might be coming from New York to LA. Same plane. But it's not that the plane will take the eggs. There's no railway track through the airs, or there's no airway track in the sky. And the plane has to go exactly along this route only. Really. Depending on the atmospheric conditions, depending on the plane's condition, depending on various factors, the plane may go off track. And each day the plane may take a different track. But eventually the plane gets to the destination. So what gets the plane to the destination is not following the specific trajectory. But pursuing the generic direction. 
The generic direction is, I want to go in this direction. And if, okay, the plane is off way this way, let me bring it this way. If it's off this way, get it this way. So what this means is that, actually, even if during our life journey we have gone off track, we can come back on track. So Krishna's plan is not so much that at every moment he's, he wants us to be micro-controlled and to do this, not this, not this. Yes, Krishna wants to guide us so that we can make healthy choices. But if we go off track, Krishna can help us to come back on track. And that's why we have to see that Krishna is there to help us. The first point I said is that we are our only resource. But second, we say, okay, but what can I do? I've got so much conditioning, I've made so many mistakes. Things can never be fixed. Everything is doomed now. Even if I try, things will do. No, it's not like that. Things are not permanently doomed. Krishna is always with us. And no matter how many things have gone wrong, Krishna's plan still works. Krishna never abandons us. Krishna's, Krishna is with us and Krishna's plan is still there for us. So by having this faith, we can keep moving forward. So Parikshit Maharaj, it was at one level a blunder. That, oh, how could he have cursed us, how could he have disrespected a sage like this, offended a sage like this. But then, through it, Krishna Rehler, he met Shukdeva Swami, and Shukdeva Swami instructed him. Now at one level we can say that these great personalities, like Shukdeva Swami, like Parikshit Maharaj, but then mistakes are orchestrated by Krishna also. So that's, that's a transcendental way of looking at things. And that's also invaluable so that we don't judge or criticize these great characters for their apparent mistakes. But we can also see their actions at a practical level. At an ethical level, not to judge them, but to learn from them how we can act. So by having this faith that Krishna, a Krishna's plan cannot be foiled by us. To think, oh, I made this mistake and to think that everything is ruined because of that. That is to give, to, to, that is to attribute too much power to ourselves. <laughs> we say, oh, I have committed a terrible mistake. We think that is humility. But sometimes it can simply be ego. If I think my mistake is so big that even Krishna can't fix it. <laughs> that is not humility. That is simply perverse ego. Yes, mistakes will have consequences. But then Krishna can fix it. When Bhishma Pitama, he remained silent when Draupadi was being dishonored in the Mahabharat. That was a serious mistake for him. But then, eventually, when he was in the arrow bed, Krishna himself came before him. Krishna came before him and helped him to have the perfect departure. So, just because he had committed a mistake did not mean that Krishna forgot his devotion. He had been devoted and as a devotee he had lived a wonderful life, but he committed a mistake. Just because of mistake, Krishna did not forget his devotion. At the same time, just because of his devotion, Krishna did not forget his mistake. Krishna was still displeased with him. And according to the according to some commentators in the Mahabharata, they say that Bhishma had to go through all this pain of the thousands of arrows piercing through his body as a reaction for his remaining silent when Draupadi was being dishonored. Now, of course, the Mahabharata also says that Krishna blessed Bhishma so that Bhishma was so absorbed in spiritual consciousness that he did not feel the pain. So, again, there can be different levels at, of understanding this. If you want to see at a transcendental level, then it's all Krishna's Leela. Like Prabhupada, in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, is praising Arjuna. He says, see, Arjuna is so sensitive, so thoughtful that that he's not just impulsively fighting the war, he's thinking about the consequences. He's so compassionate that he doesn't want others to die. And suddenly in the next chapter, Prabhupada starts saying, 
Arjuna is crying. He says, these tears are a sign of ignorance, they are a sign of material attachment, a sign of a skin disease. And you give this up. So it's like Prabhupada's purports is the way he's talking about Arjuna in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita and the second chapter. It's quite different. So the Acharya has explained that the first chapter in the Bhagavad Gita is given to describe the qualification of the candidate for enlightenment. So Arjuna was contemplative, Arjuna was sensitive, Arjuna was scripturally learned. So this being contemplative, sensitive and erudite, all these are, so the first chapter is describing Arjuna's qualifications for enlightenment. And Prabhupada goes along with it, yes Arjuna is so, so thoughtful, so sensitive. And the second chapter, the process of enlightenment is to begin. And then at that time the stress is, you are not enlightened right now. And how Arjuna is not enlightened right now, that is being stressed. Oh, he's crying, that means he's materially attached. So depending on what is the frame of reference, the same situation can be seen differently. So, the point which I am making is that we see the situation in a way that helps us to grow. So, if we are looking at the scriptural characters, we look at it in such a way that it helps us to understand, learn and grow. If we are looking at our own life also, we look at it in a way that we can learn and grow. And we can know that Krishna's plan is always there. Krishna's plan cannot be spoiled just because we have committed some mistakes. By knowing that Krishna's plan is so resilient and it will persevere through our mistakes, we can always have hope. And with that hope, we can move forward. Whatever karma may get us to, our past karma, our present karma, whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the theme of uh, to give ourselves to Krishna, we need to forgive ourselves. I started by talking of how sometimes the mind, in the mode of ignorance, it beats ourselves up for things, the way things have turned out. And we hurt ourselves more than the situation is hurting us. We hold on to negative thought patterns, self-destructive thought patterns. And if we are to give ourselves to Krishna, that's what we want to do in bhakti, we want to offer ourselves to Krishna in devotion, then we have to forgive ourselves. Why? I talked about two reasons. First is that we are our only resource. If our car is not working well, but if we don't have any other car, we just kick the car or beat the car or bang the car in frustration, we will not get anywhere. If a person's car is not working, they may want to move, drive it, others will help. But they have to be inside pushing it also. If a person has fallen the well, others can help them come out, but they have to play their part of holding on to the rope also. So if we beat ourselves so much that we become discouraged, then no one can help us. I mean Krishna can't help us. Generally when mistakes happen, when things go wrong, anger can either go outwards, where it becomes verbal or physical violence towards others, or anger can go inwards, where it becomes depression, inferiority complex, and ultimately suicide. So, by forgiving ourselves, just as like forgiving others, we let go of the anger towards them. Similarly, by forgiving ourselves, we let go of our anger towards ourselves. Talk about how Parikshit Maharaj did not hold his mistake against himself and beat himself up by that. It was a, it was a, it was a mistake to garland a, a snake, to garland with a snake a sage. But he, we, should, we need to be responsible for our actions, but we don't have to blame ourselves for our actions. Responsible means yes, this action was wrong. Blame means we're simply beating ourselves up constantly. So he, we, even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can be grateful in all situations by looking at the good in that situation. Bad has happened, okay, what is the good still there in my life? What is the good that is helping me to deal with this bad situation? By looking at that, we can be positive. 
and we can avoid becoming resentful but instead stay grateful. And the second reason how we can forgive ourselves is that no mistake is fatal. No mistake is catastrophic. Krishna's plan accommodates our mistakes. Just as if we take a wrong turn, the GPS still reroutes and guides us along. So Krishna's plan rather than thinking of if it is moving along the railway track, it is like flying through the air. It's an overall direction that is important, not the specific trajectory. So even if we go off track, as soon as we realize, instead of if we don't keep beating ourselves, but as soon as we realize we come back on track, Krishna will take us onwards. Oh, Krishna's plan and is such that he his plan is far greater than our capacity to commit mistakes. To think that our mistakes will doom us and even Krishna can't help us, that is not humility, that is ego. We are not so big that we can thwart Krishna's plan ultimately. And then I talked about how when we are practicing, uh, our, when we are going through our life, whatever mistakes we may have committed, we just stay connected with Krishna, then Krishna will guide us through. That Krishna is always with us. And whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. Hare. Yeah, so we said Krishna's pastimes are going on eternally. Does that mean Parishit Maharaj's pastimes are also going on eternally? It's possible, but I have not seen any direct scriptural reference for this. Generally, whenever scripture makes any particular statement, there is a context for that. The context is that, with respect to saying that Krishna's pastimes go on everywhere, or they are constantly going on, it is to illustrate that Krishna is Krishna is infinite and that Krishna is always accessible to us. At the unmanifest level, Krishna is performing past times even now in Vrindavan. So that is the stress that, that the whole mood of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, is the Gaudiya Vaishnava Bhakti tradition of which we are a part, the whole mood of that is that, that to feel the presence of Krishna in his absence. That the gopis when Krishna leaves Vrindavan and goes away, the gopis are separated from Krishna. That is the external vision. But the internal vision is because the recollection of Krishna, the remembrance of Krishna is so intensified, actually they are feeling Krishna's presence even more. So the whole mood of Gaudiya Vaishnavism is that to feel Krishna's presence in his absence. And there are various frames of analysis given to illustrate how we can feel his presence in his absence. So one frame of analysis is that actually Krishna, it's not just we are feeling his presence, Krishna is also there. Krishna's pastimes are going on at a, at a subtler level which we can't perceive. So now whether that applies for all his associates, especially associates of the next generation, uh, now the, these are exalted devotees, but still there is a very categorical difference between, between the soul and Krishna. We could say that if Krishna is there, Krishna's immediate associates would be there. So if Krishna is there, Yashodamai would be there, if Vasudev Dev would be there. But distant associates in a different generation, Krishna can do that, but whether he does that, we'll need a scriptural reference specific to, uh, to say that category. Thank you. Yes. Questions. Yes, sir. Uh, so one was that uh, for the mode of ignorance, right, we talk about um, moroseness being one of the symptoms, right? And um, so, yeah. I mean, when naturally things don't go our way, we feel morose, right? So, is obs excessive moroseness sign of more of ignorance or even like, okay, 
I just regretted, okay, uh, it should have been this way, but it didn't go this way. So, what's like the line where we say, okay, this is too much? Uh, okay, yeah. So, it's natural to feel bad when we commit a mistake. So, when does that feeling bad become destructive? Is there a, it become harmful? Is there a line? Yeah. If I consider these five, six, six, I am here. My mistake is here. Krishna is here. My sense of my bad feeling, my remorse, my conscience, whatever it should come here. That means here means the, the between the between me and the mystic. So that that bad feeling, that conscience or that remorse will ensure that I don't do that again. But now for me this incident is one incident in my life. My life is going to go on. And this incident, this is a bad incident, but it's happened, it's gone. But if instead of coming here, if our conscience, instead of coming between us and the wrongdoing, it comes between us and Krishna. That means that you made a terrible mistake, now your life is good for nothing. You cannot practice bhakti, you cannot be a responsible human being, you cannot do anything in your life. When it becomes our defining identity, then it becomes a serious problem. So we have to acknowledge that it was a mistake on my part. But when it starts defining us, it becomes a part of our self-definition. That is where it becomes a serious problem. And uh, uh, whether that is happening or not, we understand it by seeing how much are we dwelling on it. How much is that consuming our mental energy? If it is constantly doing that to us, then we have to keep it away. The conscience should keep us away from the wrongdoing. The conscience should not keep us away from Krishna. If there is doing that, then that's not conscience. You could say it's pseudo-conscience. It's simply the mind is a devilish voice impersonating other conscience. Okay. Okay. Second question you have? Another thing was that uh, when we are, you know, putting our hundred percent in something, in our goals basically, mm -hmm. and the results are not coming, <coughs> like, I feel naturally yeah. dejected that things didn't go my way. How how do we take that? Yeah. So when we are trying, when we do our best and still we don't get the results, then we feel dejected. What to do about that? That's why we have 2.47 in the Bhagavad Gita. Karmane vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadajina ma karma phalaheturpur ma te sangostva karmani. I was at Yale Medical College and there was a there's a Muslim professor who had come there. He was asking many questions and he said, this, this world just doesn't make any sense. The only reason we work is because we want some result from the work. The students work to get marks in the exam. We work at our job to get a salary. So he says, if we don't be attached to the work, results of the work, then how can we work? What will motivate us to work? So actually, if you look at the full words, what it's saying is much more profound. Hey, Krishna is, there's a difference between the results of our work and the goals that we have for our work. Goals are what we set before we do the work. Results are what we come, okay, we get after the work is done. Krishna is not telling don't set goals. In fact, immediately after the Bhagavad Gita got over, the Kurukshetra war started. And every day, the Pandavas would set goals. I'll take down this warrior today. I'll take down this warrior today. Especially on the 14th day, Arjuna famously said that goal that I will take down Jayadrath. So he, Krishna did not tell at that time, Karaman Neva Adhikaraste Mahafali Krishna encouraged Arjuna to fight, guided him so that he could achieve that goal. So the point here is that phala, fruit, is the result. Result is what comes after the action. So the next part of the verse is that do not ma karma phala hetirbo. Do not think that you are the cause of the result of the work. What does this mean? Actually, in a, I have a whole seminar on destiny, which I'm not going to now, but briefly. We often think that the result 
that we get is simply coming from the work that we do. So we think this is the work, this is the result. But actually in between the work and result, a lot is going on. So in between the work and the result, what is there? This is karma, this is phala. In between, if you consider this is karma, this is phala. In between karma and phala, there is daiva. And actually between karma and phala, there is daiva and kala. Daiva is destiny, karma is our action. We put in English, this our duty, there is destiny, there is duration, and then there is desired result. So it's four Ds. We do our duty. So for example, a farmer sows the seeds and plows the land as a duty. Then destiny is rains come in time in the right quantity. Then duration is the season changes to the harvesting season. And then the desired result. So karma, daiva, kala, and phala. So what the Bhagavad is telling us is, Ma karma phala heturpa. Do not think that your karma alone is producing the phala. So sometimes we may do our best and the result may not come. That, is just, that just means destiny is not favorable at that time. But if we are honest with ourselves, we'll see that sometimes we do a little work, and still a lot of result comes. It also works like that. I was counseling some cricket players in India, they're not national players, they're aspiring to become national. So they were talking about how much destiny plays a role in sports. They say all cricket players, all say batsmen, get some bad decisions. They're out and they're given, they're not out and they're given out. So, but then they said that actually in the long run it evens up. You are out sometimes and you are not out and you are given out. And you are out and you are given not out also at times. So basically what happens is the karma to follow. There is daiva and kala which comes in between. So therefore, if sometimes we have done our best and the results have not come, Prabhupada writes in the first canto of the Bhagavad Mantar quote that when things are beyond human control, there is nothing to regret. There is nothing to regret if things are beyond human control. We just accept that this is destiny and we move on. And in the future, then the des destiny is like season. Sometimes it's favorable, sometimes unfavorable. When destiny becomes favorable, then we will get the results also. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Okay. What is the difference between mistake and offense? Because in the Srimad Bhagavatam, we don't see any narration of Parikshin seeking forgiveness from Sunday Krishna. Um, so, what do we, how do we understand? Okay. How are the questions? The two questions are distinct questions, I mean. Yes, sir. what I was okay. saying is, what is the difference between mistake and what we call as offense? Because in, in our tradition, we are saying okay. if you commit an offense, you should okay, seek okay. forgiveness. Okay, so is there a difference between mistake and offense? So was what Parikshit Maharaj committed a mistake or an offense? Because we don't see him seeking forgiveness from Shamik Rishi. Yeah, <clears throat> see the broad principle of offense. The, per the essence of an offense is to create offense. Offense means, you know, this is how we should behave. Don't behave like this. This is, this is a proper behavior, this is improper behavior. So it's not that offense is like a vindictive, contagious disease waiting to pounce on you. You committed offense, now you are doomed. It's not like that. So, so as far as uh, offense is concerned, if we have done something which has hurt another person, which has, if we have no any disrespect to another person, it's always good to seek forgiveness. Now that offense might be also because of a mistake. Sometimes some offenses are just, you know, we might neglect someone because we don't know who they are. But they become the most, such a senior devotee, such an such a important person. Say, I'm sorry I neglected you. That's simply a mistake. There was no malevolent intention over there. Now, uh, what are really serious offenses which will have grave consequences in our spiritual life? are when something is done with a intention to pull someone down. <laughs> we feel envious about somebody's fame, somebody's respect, somebody's position, and then we speak something to pull them down. That is when it's an offense. 
So now Parikshit Maharaj had no malevolent intention. He was actually throughout his life very respectful to Brahmanas. But it's a circumstantial deviation from his from his dharmic behavior, from his virtuous behavior. And the whole incident was so distasteful that both Shamik Rishi and Parikshit Maharaj decided to end it there. Because even Shamik Rishi felt bad. Why did my son curse him like this for such a small thing? He chastised his son, but he thought this was the best. So Shamik Rishi also did not, Shamik Rishi could also have gone to Parikshit Maharaj and seek sought forgiveness on behalf of his son. My son should not have done this. Shamik Rishi did not do that because he felt that the, he was also very perceptive. He also knew that Parikshit Maharaj would be feeling bad about what and sometimes if we have committed a mistake and we are about to go and ask forgiveness from someone and that person will please forgive me. Then, at one level it could be amicably resolved, but it might make us feel even more embarrassed. You know, I have committed a mistake. Why are you asking forgiveness? I should be asking forgiveness for you. So both of them were feeling like that and both of them decided just let's end it. Neither of them held it against the other person. So let's end it and move on. And Shami Krishi, Prabhupada describes was a monist. He was an uh, impersonal meditator. <coughs> so that's why he did not come to where Chukdeva Swami, where they were, there were some impersonals also, but mostly it were people who were devotionally minded. So it was well known that Parikshit Maharaj is a great devotee. So that's why Shami Krishna doesn't come there. And Shami Krishna also didn't want Parikshit Maharaj to get distracted. Because he's coming here to focus on remembering Krishna. And then this incident, which is so distasteful, so disastrous actually, not just dist- distasteful from the emotional perspective, disastrous from the consequence perspective. So why trigger that memory again? So both of them just ended the chapter and both of them move on with their life. Okay? Thank you. Yes, Destiny and Krishna's will come connected. We could say destiny is Krishna's will, but there is more to it. The destiny at one level is simply a material mechanism. Say, if I pick up this phone and I drop it, I won't drop it obviously, <laughs> but if I drop it, now this it is dropping because of gravity. I could say that it is dropping because of gravity. But if the phone breaks and then I want to claim insurance for the phone. Say, how did the phone break? Because of gravity. <laughs> that would be an acceptable reason, isn't it? It's like gravity is everywhere. You know? Everybody's phone doesn't break. Why did your phone break? <laughs> so, now that means that ultimately nothing happens without Krishna's sanction. At the same time, there are certain material mechanisms. So did Krishna want my phone to break? Well, I don't have to ascribe Krishna's will to my stupidity. If I drop my phone, it's, I, there, is, there is definitely Krishna's hand in one. Krishna has set up the law of gravity. And by that law of gravity, that phone fell down. But it's not Krishna who is personally causing this phone to break when it falls down. So that means, Destined, just as the law of gravity is ultimately arranged by Krishna, but Krishna is not directly involved in making a particular thing happen. This is a law of gravity going on. So similarly, we could say destiny is a part of the material mechanism by which actions produce reactions. So normally, whenever we, if you consider uh, like a big water tank. In the water tank, water is coming in from one side and water is going out from the other side. So that water tank is the accumulated karma that we have from this and previous lives. So that accumulated karma is our destiny. And in that, some water is going inside. Water going inside means that is the karma that we are doing right now. That is called as agami karma or kriyaman karma. That's what we are doing. And then some water is coming out. That is the prarabdha and apraradha. That is what we are experiencing right now. 
So now this whole system of a water tank by which water goes in and water comes out, it's ultimately arranged by Krishna. So we could say destiny is also happening by Krishna's will. But everything that happens by destiny, it is not that Krishna wants that to happen. It is that Krishna has set up the system and sometimes within that system some things happen. So we can say Krishna is the lord of destiny. In the Mahabharata, this is what Drona tells Yudhishthir. Drona, uh, Drona tells, Dronacharya tells this to Duryodhana. Dronacharya had promised Duryodhana that I will arrest Yudhishthir and bring him as a prisoner before you. And two days on the 11th and 12th day he tries. But somehow he is not able to get Yudhishthir. Arjuna comes in the way. And Duryodhana starts criticizing. You promised me you are fighting half-heartedly because you love the Pandavas. Drona gets so annoyed with him. He says, Oh Prince, can't you see the wounds that are lacerating my whole body? I have born all these wounds just because I am trying to work for you. Yes, I promised you that I would arrest you, Vishnu. But only endeavors are in our hands. Death, the results are determined by destiny. And, O oh Prince, the Lord of Destiny is on the chariot of Arjuna. <laughs> so rather than saying destiny is Krishna's will, we can say that destiny happens, destiny is the whole system by which reactions come upon us and Krishna governs destiny. Okay. Okay. Yes? Prabhupada says that when the demons are taking birth in the seventh kind of hidden action in which we are taking birth, a lot of inauspicious you know, signs like earthquakes and storms and things like that are happening. They happen at that time. So now, because we see so many storms and earthquakes happening, or so many natural calamities happening today in, say, America, does that mean that, uh, does, does that signify anything? This signifies uh, that demons are taking birth or anything like that. Actually, there is in logic called the error of the antecedent. Error of the antecedent means if A leads to B, then if A is there, B will be there. But that does not mean if B, B is there, A will be there. Let me explain what this means. Let's say if it rains, my pavement, the pavement around my house will be wet. wet. Hmm? So, if it rained yesterday night, therefore, the pavement will be wet now. But, if the pavement is wet, that does not necessarily mean it rained yesterday night. The pavement could have been wet because maybe there is a sprinkler, and the sprinkler has uh, poured water everywhere. The, spring, the pavement could be wet because maybe there is a leakage somewhere, water has seeped out. So, unless we can prove that the only cause of B is A, we can't infer from the presence of B the presence of A. So similarly, earthquakes may occur at a time when demons are appearing. But that is not the only time earthquakes occur. Earthquakes can occur at many other times. They can just be, uh, we can see them at multiple levels. We can say at one level it's just the seismic plates of the earth are disturbed. That's why earthquakes occur. We can say that earthquakes occur because Maybe we are creating some geological disturbance in the seismic plates by mining and disrupting the Earth's balance. We can say that earthquakes occur because people are doing bad karma and the karmic reactions are coming. Once we go into nature, it is very, very difficult to ascribe any particular cause to 
know about natural, natural calamities. Generally, our mood should be, how can I help? We see when Parikshit, when uh, Prithu Maharaj is the king, at that time there is a drought in his kingdom. Now at that time, he doesn't go around, I am a citizen of some bad, some bad karma because of which they have got it. This is drought because demons are, no, the drought is there, I am the king. It's my responsibility to help. How can I help? And he works to help. So to the extent any philosophy helps in dealing with the problem, to that extent we talk about the philosophy. But if philosophy is not helping us to deal with the problem, then we don't have to bring philosophy too much into the picture. I'll conclude with an example for this. Say in the 10th canto of uh, when, Deva, when Devaki is about to be killed, by uh, Kamsa, at that time, Vasudev has to hold his hand and stop. Ultimately, life and death are destined. If you are destined to die, then even kill, killing Devaki will not stop your death. So now, Vasudev can turn this argument around and he can think, if Devaki is destined to die, my trying to stop Kamsa is not going to work. <laughs> Because the Vedic culture is not destiny centered, it is duty centered. So for Kamsa, he is deviating from his duty. His brother and his sister, he's a brother and his sister is getting married. He's meant to protect her, he's meant to cherish her, he's meant to shower affection on her. He's doing the exact opposite. So when somebody starts deviating from their duty, remind them that this deviation from duty will not save you from destiny. Stick to it. Except destiny and stick to your duty. But in the name of destiny, if somebody gives up their duty, if uh, Vasudeva is Vasudeva's husband, he's meant to protect his wife. If he gives that up, then that is not proper. So just as philosophy is important, the purpose of philosophy is important. And we always need to understand the purpose of philosophy is compassion. We want to help people. The purpose of philosophy is not to judge people, to blame people, to label people. So, uh, if such calamities are happening, we can see how can we be a part of the solution. If we can be, well and good. If we can be about a specific part of the solution, we can be. Otherwise, we can be at least raising our own consciousness. The more we foster spiritual consciousness, the more we can be a part of the solution. Thank you. So, we'll stop with that. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Shri Prabhupad ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Gaur Premanandi. Gaur Premanandi.